<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. People, what are some of your creepy, scary, unsettling experiences? 15 years old. I had just got home from work, so I went to my bedroom to change out of my work clothes and get ready for bed. I'm in the middle of undressing when I look to my bedroom window to catch my reflection. And I see a man's face. I dropped to the floor and turned off the lights, scrambling to get dressed, still watching the window. The face is gone, but I'm still watching, then. A fucking camera. No face, just a camera pointed at me sitting on the floor. I bolt from my room and tell my mom and brother. My brother went outside, and our ladder from the backyard was lying there. But nobody around. Couldn't sleep for a year after that, just stared at that window. Haven't thought about that in years. When I was a teen I worked at a cable access studio and made many movies. My neighbors gave me their father's old video camera. They told me he never used it but it didn't seem to work anymore and had a tape jammed in it. I fixed it up and on the tape was hours of him driving around at night and filming people through their windows. Nothing overly sexual was on it but there is something unsettling about seeing peeping Tom footage of a guy eating dinner with his family or over 20 minutes of some girls dancing around in their room. When I was about 7 to 8 years old my family rented a house close to the beach for a week. The drive wasn't very long but as an 8 year old by the time we got there I really had to feed the porcelain stallion a brown bone. We pull into the driveway and are met by a middle-aged woman who owned the house and showed us the place and told us about the town and what to do etc. My first instinct is to find the bathroom so I ask and she tells me it's the second door on the right after the kitchen. Go inside and open the bathroom door to an older guy just standing there looking at me. I kinda duck my head down, say sorry, and went back outside. They noticed I was back pretty fast and I told them there was someone in the bathroom already. That's when it got weird. The lady looked at me confused and said there's no one else in the house. I explained that I definitely saw someone in that bathroom. After searching the house we find no evidence of anyone else being there. After a while the lady told us her dad owned the house and lived there and recently passed away. She inherited the house and wasn't sure what to do with it so she started renting it out. Pretty sure I saw that dude. This is the story of how a creepy encounter with a scary man at a harbor cafe saved me from something even more terrifying. It was in the autumn of 1994 and I was 19 years old. At the time my dad had been working for almost 6 months abroad, and I was planning a surprise visit. My dad and I have always been close, I am an only child and my mother died of cancer when I was still a baby. So it was just my dad and I really, a tiny little family but he made up for it by being the most awesome parent ever. Now that I wasn't a little kid anymore, I appreciated that more and more. I had had booked the ticket and was ready to go, it was gonna be great fun to surprise him with a visit. I had to take the ferry though, and I had just gotten my driving license and felt really unhappy about having to drive my little car on board the ferry, and decided to not bring a car at all, and just rent one once I got there. Having time to spend I decided to have coffee at a nearby cafe since I was early and they hadn't started letting people onto the ferry just yet. At the cafe there were lots of truck drivers and I soon realized I was the only woman there. One man, a 40-ish bloke with ice blue eyes and tattoos all over was eyeing me from across the room. Something about him made my skin crawl. I got up to leave, feeling suddenly very uncomfortable, and to my utter horror he followed. What do I do now? I asked myself. This was before everyone owned a cell phone, I might add. I decided to try and look busy and maybe he would leave me alone. So I pulled out my ticket and tried to look like I was reading it carefully, when he suddenly snatched it from my hand and said, I'm on the same boat. I'll have hours of your company then how lovely in a voice that was an absurd combination of jovial flattery and hidden hostility. I felt it very strongly that if I got on that boat, with this man who now knew my booking details, I'd be in grave danger. I can't explain why the feeling was so overwhelming, but it was, and I decided there and then to not get on the boat. The ticket had been cheap anyway, I could get on the next one instead. I hid in the ladies' room until I knew the ferry had left and then I went to rebook my ticket. The story could have ended here, a creepy encounter with a stalkerish man but it doesn't. I was right in the assumption that getting on that ferry would have been unbelievably dangerous. Have you figured it out yet? The date was September 28, 1994, the name of the ship was MS Estonia, and that cold night she sank in the Baltic Sea, taking 852 people with her, resulting in the worst ferry catastrophe to strike Sweden to this day. I still recall that day with horror, and wonder what would have happened if this creepy man had not taken an interest in me? If I had not listened to my instinct and gotten on board instead of waiting for the next boat. Would I have been among the survivors? 
Or would my dad have seen my name on the list of lives lost in the Baltic Sea? Not to me, but to my sister. Her husband and her had just had their first child a few months prior. My brother-in-law was working the graveyard shift at his job as my sister stayed home taking care of my nephew. Around 2 a.m., she heard loud knocking on her back door. She went to go check it out and saw a lady banging on the door asking for my sister to let her in. The lady told my sister that her husband had just beat her down the street and was looking for her. My sister was hesitant to let her in since she had a newborn in the house and didn't want to interfere. She told the lady that the best she could do was call the police for her. The lady told my sister to not call the police and to let her in. This is where my sister got suspicious. She went to get her phone and called 911. When she went back to the door, the lady was gone. The police arrived a few minutes later and they told my sister that the same situation happened a few streets down. Apparently the couple would do this act to get into people's homes. I'm sure this is very common but having it almost happen to my sister and my nephew just creeps me out. Some real clockwork orange shit. I know there is a rational explanation for this but it is what I saw. It was a pitch black, rural road in Pakistan. The kind of road that there are simply no cars, no buses, no domiciles, no farms, nothing. Absolutely nothing but undeveloped land on both sides of the road, just open, arid land. What I'm saying is, there is nothing out here, when in our car headlights I definitely see something moving in the distance. I'm in the passenger seat, and this figure is on my side, and at first, very first, it seems like a large animal, like a cow or buffalo, or something, BC it walks very. Not human. As the driver slows down, and starts the blaring the horn to alert this thing, it turns its head and it's a very, very, frightening old, face of a woman, with orange ringlets framing her face, and her eyes are really black. But this is not the scariest part. The scariest part is that I could clearly make out, was that her hair was not human-like and that while she stood on two legs, the feet at the bottom, were completely, turned around, backwards. Her feet were backwards. I had a panic attack and passed out in the car. Cop here. I was dispatched to a house at about 1 a.m. for a prowler. We get there and talk to the residents. Long story short they saw two people wearing masks, one Jason-style hockey mask, don't remember the other, in the yard across the street. It was like two weeks past Halloween so it seemed believable. We check the area and don't see anything. 10 to 8. It's worth noting the residents didn't seem drunk slash high slash crazy at all. A few times you'll get a similar call and get there to find the resident is strung out on meth and seeing things. However, back to the story. An hour later we get called back. This time we have our dispatcher on the phone with them while we are surrounding the area. We, about five of us, are in a perfect position, dispatch tells us they can still see the prowlers in the next yard. We start to move in. Dispatch says the resident saw the two prowlers wave and move into the shed. Guess where I am? That's right, next to the shed. I give verbal commands, bang on the door, and nothing. Fine. I'll come in after you. Doors open and, empty. I even think to check for a trap door. Nothing. It is raised about 4 inches so there isn't even a possibility of a door leading out. Again check the area and find nothing. I talk to the residents. They said as I was moving in on the shed the two put their finger to their lips, giving the, sh sign, and then they both waved. They moved into the shed as I was next to it. We went over every possibility trying to come up with an explanation. If the caller was just fucking with us they had no prior history of it, as in repeated calls for service at the address. I'm not much of a believer in paranormal stuff but I can still appreciate a situation where I cannot logically explain what just happened. A few years back, I was driving over to Indianapolis from Ohio to spend the weekend with my grandparents. My younger brother was in the car with me, but we were two, 20-some-year-old males at the time. The trip had been pretty normal, but about a mile or two from Newcastle I started to hear an odd humming from the front right tire of my 99 Crown Vic. Back then it was weird for my car to make strange noises so I pulled off at the Newcastle exit, and got it into the first parking lot I could. I grabbed my mag light, you know the kind the cops carried, and went looking about the underside of my car and around my right tire. No crazy hooks or dead guys clinging to my undercarriage folks, this is a true story. I had been so focused on getting my car off the road safely that I did not notice the surrounding area. But around 11 p.m. that fall night I found myself standing outside my car under the single functioning streetlight in the parking lot of the creepiest thing abandoned hotel you could imagine. For those of you unfamiliar with cheap Midwest hotels, it was one of those layouts where you had a head office near the corner of the building, 
by the parking lot entrance and then all the individual rooms opened directly to the parking lot. It was a far shot from an abandoned Hilton is what I'm trying to say. I've been making this trip from Ohio to Indy for the last 20 years, at least once a month, if not twice. I've pissed in every publicly available bathroom on the route, eaten at every restaurant and pumped gas at every station. Standing in that lot that night I realized that I had never ever seen this old hotel before. The tire I thought, it will make it to the next exit and I scrambled to get over to the driver's side door, looking every fucking direction for a psychopath with a knife, or some little ghostly kid with a teddy bear, or an army of undead truckers out for vengeance, but there was nothing. When I got back onto the highway, the tire noise was gone, the car ran perfectly, and my brother and I didn't make a sound the rest of the way to Indianapolis. That's not the creepy part though. Two days later, we're heading back to Columbus O, and as we pass Newcastle we looked for the hotel. It was gone. The parking lot was there, with the single street light that I had parked under, but there was no building. I thought that it must have been demolished, you could see the outline of the hotel in the asphalt from the parking lot, but there were no tread marks from digging or demolition equipment, no dirt dragged out of the foundation, or a single misplaced shingle in the lot. The parking lot looked untouched for the last few years, but the building had vanished. One night, about 10 months ago, there was a pretty heavy snowstorm in my area. All of the roads were closed and a curfew was issued for everybody except emergency medical personnel. I had been shoveling snow for most of the day and was dead tired come nightfall. Didn't have the energy to do much of anything besides eat dinner and lay down. I fire up some OG Star Trek and begin to doze off. A couple of hours later, around 1 AM, I hear the sound of a door rattling and a slight whisper saying my name, Vladimir underscore Ponin. I sit up a bit and realize it's coming from my parents' room, becoming fainter with the passing time. After 10 minutes or so, I gather up the courage to see what the hell is going on. Shitty folding knife in hand, I peek out into the hallway and don't see anything. The noise is still coming from the room next door, the rattling becoming more rushed as I approach. Cautiously, I open the door and sneak inside. It's pitch black and I can't see anything. My eyes are taking entirely too long to adjust to the darkness. I'm shuffling forward, and all of a sudden, something grabs and pulls on my leg. At this point I was so freaked out I jumped back. As the whispers continued, I recognized my dad's voice. He was asking me for help. He had a stroke while walking to use the bathroom around 1 AM that night. After he fell, he was able to use his left foot to rattle the door to his bathroom. My mom fell asleep on the couch in the living room and wasn't around to help or hear. I was able to grab the house phone and call 911, and despite the weather, the police and an ambulance arrived within 10 minutes. That was the scariest night of my life. The doctors told us there wasn't much hope for my dad before going into surgery, since he had a hemorrhagic stroke and there was a massive amount of bleeding. Fast forward 10 months and my old man is cognitively the same, just paralyzed on his right side. He had every infection under the sun while in the hospital, but he staved them off and is still with us today. He was my best friend before the incident, and my hero after. This is not paranormal, but was immensely creepy at the time. I was visiting my hometown and decided to pick up my old high school friend from his house and take him to dinner and a drink to catch up. He is kinda stressed and tells me that his ex, with whom he had broken up with over two years prior, has been stalking him and harassing him. I drive him home afterwards, and it starts to drizzle. As I drop him off at his house, the neighborhood was dark and quiet by now, we both notice a bag tied to my side view mirror, it was likely attached when we were at the restaurant. We open it to see a poorly taken photo of a tree taken at night with flash. There was a brief letter, obviously written from his ex, that said, I buried our first love letter under this tree years ago. This tree is growing from our love. I made sure my friend got into his house all right and got the heck out of there. The most unsettling incident in my life, well, one of them, would be during family dinner when I was about 8 years old, my mom suddenly came out with it took me months to get your father's blood stains out of the wall. The smell of his body was terrible and really clung to, and then gazed off into the distance, utterly unaware of how shocking and unconducive to eating such a remark would be. My dad committed suicide not long after they split up. He did it in the kitchen of our flat while we were staying at grandma and grandpa's house. Someone, presumably my dad, also turned the thermostat up to the max before he died. He wasn't found for several weeks either. So, yeah, I can imagine it was quite a horrific scene. My impression was that mom was psychologically damaged by going through that, and as a result, she lost any sense of what was appropriate to share with a child or not. Sometimes I do wonder if he was murdered and that's why the thermostat was cranked to the max, 
and also no one bothered to check on a man who was known to be suicidal and alone in a house, not going to work and failing to show up for his psych appointments, for three weeks. At the least, it was neglectful. Sometimes it's hard hugging my mom, when I have suspicions that she had a greater role in my dad's death than she will ever admit to. I know how clever and scheming she can be. But I will never know for sure, and I know how hurtful and angry I get when someone else thinks they know that I'm guilty of something and I know I'm innocent. So I try to keep it buried. When I was in high school I was home alone one night during the winter, and I was upstairs on the computer. I was on AIM talking to someone when I specifically remember having an uneasy feeling, and telling the person I was imming that I felt like someone was in the house, or that I was being watched. I went to the downstairs and peeked around the corner and saw our back door that went into our sunroom wide open. It was about 10 degrees out and no one else was there, but this door was open. I freaked out and ran to the kitchen and got a big ass knife. I started screaming shit like I knew someone was there, like I see a motherfucker. I called the cops. Or whatever, I don't remember. I walked through the house in a way that no one could get out past me without me seeing, so I thought. After I cleared the house I assumed maybe it wasn't latched and a draft pushed the door open or something. Got over it pretty quick. Anyway, later that night, about five houses down a woman was tied up in her bedroom by a man with a knife who threatened to kill her. I don't remember the specifics, but she somehow escaped and called the cops and the guy was never caught. Still have no idea if anyone was in my house that same night, but it's an awfully weird coincidence if not. If anyone has any insight into what I saw please share. Okay, let's dive in. This happened while I was in my hometown visiting family slash friends last summer. My best friend and I were parked outside of my mother's house smoking cigarettes and catching up when all of a sudden I felt a warm light on my face. I looked out of the car window and to my right roughly 10 feet in front of me was a floating ball of light, it was bright red slash orange in the center but became more yellowish as the ball expanded slightly. The brightness and size of the object should have cast off some kind of light but the homes around it stayed dark, as did the ground. I was at a loss for words, I couldn't move, I just start. My best friend finally realized I was entranced, she turned her head to look at me and that's when she saw it too. I had been watching for about a minute at this point, the ball of light hovering delicately in the air. The slow calculated movements began to get a little faster and the ball condensed from a large oval back to a rounder ball about the size of a basketball. It then floated quite quickly behind some houses and disappeared. We just sat in silence for a few minutes trying to piece together what we just saw. We haven't spoken about what we saw that night since and even the memory leaves me with a strong sense of missing something. I'm not sure what I saw that night but it will stay with me forever. Driving on a super isolated road late at night in Buttfuck, New Mexico, 285 North, for those who know. For those who don't, it's a skinny little two-lane road for the most part which goes right through the middle of a lot of nothing with roughly 100 miles of fuck all on either side of it, and got followed for a long ways by a huge black pickup truck. One of those giant Dodge King Ranch things, all black, cow catcher on the front, limo black on all the windows, everything. It tailgated me at 85 miles per hour for about 75 miles, and when I stopped at a truck stop to pee it pulled off too, but nobody got out. It just idled away in the parking lot until I got back in and got on the highway again. Fucker followed me all the way to Carlsbad before peeling off and heading back south. I've never seen it again, but I refuse to make that drive by myself anymore. My fiancé and I decided to go camping. When we were getting the camping permit, we were told the first night we were staying was going to be packed with people, but the second night was going to be only us at the campground. One thing to mention is we always choose a campsite that has a single entrance that we can block off with the car for safety. The first night goes without a hitch. The second night rolls around. We were sitting around the fire as it started to die around 3 AM. We're about two seconds away from going into the tent when a man with a headlamp on shows up and is trying to get around my car into our campsite. The headlamp shining at us blocked the view of the top half of his body. My fiancé walks up to see what he wants, and the guy asks if we hear the loud music playing from the bar down the road. My fiancé gets about a foot away from him, then does a complete about face and makes a beeline for where we have our gun, but doesn't grab it. I joke with the guy, saying, yeah, it's just great. He said, if they're doing it to annoy me, I'll be set free. Do you understand? I try to joke with him again, but he cuts me off and says, no. If they are doing it to annoy me, I'll be set free. Do you understand? I said, very clearly, yes, I understand. He says, good. That means no prison, and immediately walks away. I immediately call 911 as my fiancé hands me the gun while he literally throws everything unceremoniously into our car to leave. 
He tells me that, when he got close enough to see the man's face, his face was pure insanity, and that's why he turned immediately around to go for the gun. Right when we finished throwing everything into the car, the police showed up. They said they saw the man leaving the campsite and asked him what he was doing. He said he was very upset about the music and was asking anyone he found nearby if the music was bothering them before he went to the bar to ask them to turn the music down. As semi-reasonable as this sounded, the cop said, he was not normal. There was something very wrong with him. We're glad you called, and we were advised to leave the area if we were able to. It was the single scariest moment of our lives and we haven't been camping since. It's the early 1980s and I'm in grade 10. I play in the concert band and we do a performance at the school one evening in the late fall. It all goes well and I'm walking home by myself afterwards, I would say it's around 10 p.m. The town that I grew up in has a bunch of walking paths, it's dark out but the paths are well lit and perfectly safe. I was not on high alert at all, just happily moseying my way home like any other day. I'm almost there, just one more gradual slope up a hill, over the bridge, turn right and I'm home. I reach the beginning of the long uphill slope to the bridge and I look up and stop dead in my tracks with an eerie sense of dread. It takes a few seconds to process why, there is a man standing at the top of the hill, probably 50 yards away just before the bridge, and he's looking at me. It's not unusual to see other people along this path, it's fairly well traveled during the day. But it's night and there's no one else around, just me and this guy. Then I realize what made me stop so suddenly, I can only see his silhouette as the lights from the road behind him outline his shape. But he's standing there akimbo, hands on his hips, and he's wearing a fucking top hat. So all of this takes about a second to process and I realize I'm just standing there at the base of the hill looking up at him. I can sense something that can only be described as pure evil, I know he's looking right at me and, for a brief moment, I'm paralyzed. I can feel him looking at me. My rational brain takes over and I'm able to step off the path and move behind some trees that block his view of me. I quickly go though my options, keep walking up the path because obviously my mind is playing tricks. Either I saw something that wasn't there or it's just some guy walking his dog, right? Okay, so I slowly peek out from behind the tree and there he is, in the exact same spot, in the exact same stance, still looking directly at me and still wearing the goddamn top hat. Oh, and did I mention the sense of pure evil piercing though my very core? Yep, still there. Option number two, run like hell, which is what I did. To this day, I still regret running away. It bothers me that I'll never know exactly who or what that was, waiting for me at the top of the hill, right before the bridge. Did it really happen? In my mind, absolutely. But I can't be sure. If it happened today, I would run up the hill towards him just so I could find out what it really was. If I ever see him again, I will but it's been over 30 years and still no sign of him. To this day nobody has ever believed my story, but I will never forget this and have never doubted myself. I've always had a hard time sleeping by myself, and even to this day I get upset when my boyfriend tells me he isn't going to stay the night, 20 years slash OF. I have to sleep as close to the wall as possible or have the TV on and fairly loud when I sleep. One night when I was in about 6th 7th grade, I woke up from a dead sleep to see a man early 30s. Big nose. Dressed in a green soldier's outfit, I don't know much about war or anything, but an earlier outfit, nothing like we wear today, sitting on the edge of my bed looking over me and smiling. It sounds creepy, but as scared as I was to sleep alone I actually felt really calm. His smile was nice and friendly, I've actually always been convinced that he was some old relative of mine or something. We both just sat there, my eyes were wide open staring, I literally did not blink throughout this entire event. After about 10 seconds of sitting there, he literally vanished into thin air. It was like the meme of the black kid doing the peace sign and in each picture he fades out a little more until he's gone. That's what the soldier did, he just faded away until he was gone. Still not blinking, I sat up and looked around my room to see if he was still there or not, which he wasn't. I lay her in bed for a minute or two, pretty much in shock from what just happened, and then I laid back down and went to sleep. How I was able to sleep so easily, I have no idea. But he really didn't scare me like I said, I felt more calm seeing him and could tell he didn't want to hurt me. I've told friends and family since this happened and only my dad believes me, he also sees old people sometimes when he sleeps but that's another story. Since everybody else thinks I'm crazy when I tell that story, maybe Reddit will appreciate it. We rented a house that never felt like home. You always felt creeped out walking in there like you were being watched. My BF and our roommate both worked nights so I would be there by myself a lot. One night I was doing my usual stuff and watching some TV before bed. 
I had this overwhelming feeling all night that I should avoid the hallway and not look directly down it, it was creepy. The feeling of being watched and terrified lasted or about two hours before I decided to suck it up and make my way to my room. I left the hallway lights on and went to bed. Just as I turned to the side table light I heard a drawer being pulled out and hitting the stopper. I turned on the light and nothing was out of place. This went on about six times before I decided I was sleeping with the light on. I curled up under the covers and waited for the BF to get home. He comes rolling in about 3 AM. He's laughing at me for being such a pussy gets into bed and turned the light off and that's when all hell broke loose. All the doors down the hallway slammed shut one by one then our closet doors started rattling. The sound coming from inside could only be described a total destruction, it sounded like the shelves the pole and everything in there was being tossed around. The BF joined me under the covers and we were both terrified. After it stopped it took 5 to 10 minutes to convince him to go check around the house. Nothing was out of place and our roommate had drove 3 hours back home that night to be with his family so we knew it wasn't him. We slept with the light on the rest of the night and moved out soon after. I still can't drive by that house without being creeped out. One day my friend and I decided to go camping at a hot spring that was closed due to a recent fire. We arrived there and set up our tent, it was about 8 pm. We stripped completely naked and went up to the hot spring, I brought a machete and a bag of goldfish. We had to climb up to it and the only way going down was going back the slippery way we came. We hung there for about two and a half hours when a flashlight came on from above our heads. There was someone right above us. Keep in mind it's 10.30 at a closed down site when it's pitch black. So we are in the worst possible position. Wet, naked, cold, alone, dark, and all we have is a machete and a bag of goldfish. Well this person walks around the area for about 45 with a flashlight before it suddenly stops. My friend and I still decide to stay there for a bit and now it is 1. Then we run out when it's 30 degrees so we're shivering cold. We get our pants and unlaced shoes on. He packs up our tent while I walk around with a machete on watch. Then we begin to run through the black burnt forest and since we were so scared we thought that everything was something. I thought the wind was a distant laugh or a branch was a face. But eventually we made it back to the car after an hour of traversing the forest. A week later on the news a dead body was found in the river nearby. So I went camping with some buddies a few years ago. We decided to go on our spring break in high school and take as few items as we possible could because we are young and dumb. We went to one of my friend's dad's land and decided to hike the first day until we found a good spot. We found one probably about 3 hours in and set up shop. Now I don't recall what everyone else brought but I know I brought a sleeping bag, a machete, hiking boots plus clothes. No one brought food because we wanted to hunt to eat like some real men ought to be young again. Everything went surprisingly well the first two nights, we managed to kill a few rabbits and a snake. We're all sitting around the campfire at night pretty drunk when we heard it. A loud long deep howl. We all stopped and looked at each other for a few moments and then a chorus of howls began. They were all around us eight I asked my friend if he thought it was coyotes or wolves. He said that he has heard of them having coyotes out there before which pfft. Big deal of its coyotes but the howls were so deep. He had his cell phone so he called his dad and his dad told us that there had been some sightings of wolves in the last few weeks. Now typically wolves will leave you alone but we were all drunk, didn't have a tent and horrified we were going to be eaten by these wolves. We stayed up the whole night to keep an eye out and the closest we heard was rustling behind the bushes and the glow of eyes behind the tree line. So horrifying honestly. Thankfully we all survived and hiked as fast as we could back to civilization. One time when I was in middle school I fell asleep on the couch in our living room. Around 1 in the morning I woke up and saw a man walk through the wall adjoining our living room to my brother's bedroom. The man noticed me and turned to face me. He had half of his face missing as if he had been dragged along the highway. He put his finger to his lips as if to tell me not to tell anyone and then turned forward and walked through our glass door out into the yard. Obviously freaked out I ran into my brother's room to find an empty bed. I run screaming and crying to my parents and they freak out and start calling all my brother's friends houses trying to find it. When they finally got in touch with him they found out he had been at a college party drinking about an hour away. My dad went to pick my brother and his best friend up not wanting them to drive home drunk. The next day we found out that the kid who was originally going to drive my brother home was killed when he was ejected from his car during a drunk driving accident. A few years ago my family moved to New Hampshire. First off, let me explain that the basement had a door that you could open in the backyard and that the door was made out of plywood if someone wanted to break in, they could have. Well, myself, my three sisters, and my brother were in the living room one night, basement door in the living room. 
My brother is trying to scare everyone and starts saying he can hear things coming from the basement. Finally he gets up and opens the door to the basement. We see someone's shadow and hear someone running at full speed down the basement stairs. We scream bloody murder, stepdad comes down with butcher knives ready to kill, he's in the basement and no one is there. The door is still intact outside and ever since then the dog wouldn't go into the living room, never would go into the basement either. I was 16 so a few weeks after that I left to live with other family members. Note. It happened last night. I picked up a nasty cold last week visiting Boston. I've been all coffee and phlegmy and mucusy and gross. Sleeping is obviously difficult. My spouse says that I coughed for hours when either I had been soundly asleep, so I'm sleeping in the other room. Last night I woke up in the middle of the night, completely unable to breathe. Not like my nose is stuffed up, breathing is difficult but I'm literally choking and zero is moving through my body and my brain is beginning to starve for oxygen. My guess is I rolled onto my back and my respiratory system got blocked with mucus or something. I stood up and still couldn't breathe. I ran to the main bedroom and dropped onto all fours and still, not a single molecule of air was moving into or out of my body. I'm there for what felt like an eternity, like I'm underwater or someone is strangling me, completely incapable of taking a single breathe. Finally, after probably 45 seconds, the phlegm or whatever moves just a little bit and I'm able to draw in a tiny amount of air and begin coughing. I was in full on tears and thought I was going to die right there. All I could think about was my dear childhood friend who passed away last year in his sleep in what seemed like a simple flu, at the age of only 37, and that I was about to follow him from a stupid cold. I can't imagine what would have happened if I had been 60 or 80 or whatever and had that experience, or maybe even just unhealthy from lifestyle or some other disease. I might not have been able to write this post this morning. I was a vehicle mechanic in the army reserves when I was younger. On one overnight drill we drove a convoy of trucks from Baltimore to Fort AP Hill Virginia on the old state highways. Things started out pretty normally but as we were driving the convoy gradually starts slowing down and after a while the whole line of trucks has slowed to a crawl. We pulled off the road and the guy in the lead truck tells us his 5 ton won't accelerate at all. We switch trucks and sure enough, it won't go above 5 miles per hour. I dropped the truck out of the convoy and my motor sergeant stayed with me in a pickup truck. About a half hour later we happen across an old gas station and decide that we are not going anywhere fast so we will park the truck there. I was to remain with the truck until they could come back later and transfer everything to another one. So off drives my motor sergeant and I am out in the middle of southern bumfuck Maryland with nobody around. It starts getting dark and I see the lights are on and the restaurant is open at the gas station and I am hungry as hell so and I go. I sit down in a booth by the window where I can keep an eye on the truck and a lady comes and asks me what I want to eat. I ask if I can have a menu and she says she doesn't have one but they have fried chicken and mashed potatoes and that sounded pretty good to me so I order it. I was starving hungry and it was the best damn fried chicken I have ever eaten. I finish, get the bill, leave my money on the table and walk back out to the truck. I stayed awake for a while but eventually I laid down across the seat and slept a few hours. Now about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, another truck shows up with a bunch of guys and we start transferring gear to the other 5 ton. One of the guys says you must be starving and I say no, I ate at the restaurant. Well, this guy gives me the strangest look and says you didn't eat at that restaurant. Look at it. Well, it's the middle of the night and I can't see the building that well and I just told him he was crazy and we leave. I slept a couple hours and then we had to go back in the morning to deal with this broke down truck and that's when I had a WTF moment. All the windows to this station are boarded up and the place looks like it had been abandoned for 20 years. At this point I am seriously weirded out so I go over and peek through the glass on the door which is was uncovered. My fucking money was still sitting on the table. I couldn't get away from that place fast enough. The time I went looking for a dead body in an abandoned factory. Cop here. Anyone want a story? About 9 years ago we get a call from a payphone, there's a dead body in the abandoned building at corner 1st and Main, street names made up for this story. An officer responds to the area and can't find anything that would be considered an abandoned building. The caller hung up without leaving any information. And the payphone that he called from was several miles from that area. So the officer clears out the call having no contact. The next day we get another phone call from another payphone. There's a dead body inside the abandoned building at the corner of 1st and Main. Again they hang up without offering any other information. This time I get dispatched the report. I head up to the area of that intersection and start looking around. Now understand that I live and work in a fairly sizable metropolitan area and this was when the economy was still good. Booming even. Abandoned buildings were hard to come by at that time. 
I drive through all the shopping plaza is a little industrial complexes within the vicinity of that intersection and I can't come up with anything. So I start driving a little bit further in each direction. But I remember that there's some new construction that hasn't been finished yet. And I wonder if they think that those are considered abandoned. I get out of my car and walk through a bunch of businesses that are still in the framing stages. But I can't find anything. As I leave the area I'm now more than a mile from the original call location. As I pull out onto the major roadway I stop for traffic and look in front of me. There it is. A gigantic electrical component factory that has been vacant for probably the last 15 years. It has a 9 foot wall around the entire perimeter and the landscaping is still maintained. So it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb right away. That added to the fact that I'm pretty far away from where the caller said it should be. But then again, it's abandoned. It's definitely abandoned and has been for a very long time. So I call for another unit to back me up and we go check it out. We use a drainage pipe to climb up and over the 9 foot wall to get inside the perimeter. We start walking the building checking every single door. When I say this place is big I mean it's huge. It's over 100,000 feet dot squared. It's like an old abandoned Motorola, or Freescale, or Intel type building. It has gigantic coolers on the outside, pipes running all over which way, ductwork running down the sides of the buildings, loading docks, and a basement. Every door we come across is locked and secured. We continue walking around looking for anything out of place. As I get about three quarters of the way around the building I pull on a door and it flings open. I called my backup who comes over to me. We knock, announce, and enter the building. As we step into a hallway that leads about 100 yards down with doors on either side, the door we just stepped into closes. And it's black. Pitch black. Light can't see my fucking nose on my face black. We start moving through the building, trying to clear each room has the best of the two of us can. But this place is absolutely gigantic and each room is connected to what seems like four other rooms. We stepped into one room and the door closes behind us. It must have been some old clean room or something. It was the weirdest thing because there was no sound. Nothing. I couldn't hear the traffic outside, or the grumble of electricity or air moving. All the sounds that we heard throughout the rest of the building were gone in this one room. When I spoke to my partner our voices didn't even echo. It must have had some kind of sound cancelling insulation or something. But it freaked me the fuck out. The floor had random 12 inch holes in it, that led down to a basement that was flooded by over 6 feet of water. Wire, ceiling panels, and wire jacketing were hanging from the ceiling. There was broken glass, broken pieces of metal and brick, holes in the drywall, and abandoned equipment all over. I clearly remember thinking to myself that if there ever a time that I would be attacked by skinless zombie dogs, this would be it. And the entire time we are trying to find a dead body. As though this shit wasn't freaky enough I'm actively looking for a dead guy. We end up moving through the building clearing it as best we can till we get to what was definitely the industrial part of the building. Gigantic boilers, evaporative coolers, and components that run the building. Oh, and spiders. A shit ton of spiders. We stepped into a room and find that it is a dead end. We've reached the end of the building and we don't have any further to go. The room is about 20 by 30, and contains five very large electrical cabinets. They are about 8 feet tall, and each about 4 feet wide, sitting next to each other. And they look exactly how I would design the lab of an evil genius if I had to make a sci-fi movie. The entire thing was covered in dials levers and red and green buttons. But only the panel in the middle was still illuminated. It had one steady glowing red light on it. The first and only light I saw in that entire building. My partner calls out to me you got anything? I replied no. Nothing in here. Looks like this was a gigantic waste of time. Just let me take a look behind these cabinets and we'll be good to head back to our cars. The panels have about 18 to 24 inches of room on each end between them and the wall and the wall behind them. I walk over to the left side and peek my head around. And bam, there he is. A fucking dead guy on the ground, pinned between the wall and the cabinet. He's on his back, arms in front of his chest like a T-Rex, and he has some injuries. And I nearly shot him. Not gonna lie. He scared the living shit out of me. Even though I spent the last hour actively looking for him, I still wasn't completely ready for it. So skip ahead to calling detectives etc. At the time, stripping copper was fairly new, at least to our area. I didn't recognize what the wire jacketing meant, as I hadn't seen it before. These two knuckleheads in breaking into this abandoned factory for god knows how long and systematically stripping every piece of metal out of it. And they made it all the way to the very last room. The only room that still have power running to it. See, the middle panel, you controlled the fire suppression system for the building. 
and the owner's insurance policy required that it remained on active. When these guys opened up the panels they must have thought they hit the mother load. Each one contained an inch and a half copper cable. Now an inch and a half copper cable is worth quite a bit of money, but it also conducts quite a bit of electricity. They cut through the first one successfully, the leaving the sharp ends exposed inside the cabinet. But when this poor sap started cutting into the second one he got the right of his lifetime. Not only did he electrocute himself, but the current coursing through his arms pulled him into the cabinet stabbing one of the exposed ends of the previous cable into his chest. This kills the copper thief. Although nobody believes me, I know what I saw. And it wasn't a stealth bomber. I was about 14, and at about 10.30 I was in bed trying to fall asleep on a school night. I started to hear a hum that quickly began growing in intensity, as whatever was making it got closer. So I bent the blinds on the window behind me and peered out. Something bright was steadily approaching, and it was flying very low. As it got closer, I began to see more detail. In the middle was a bright white sphere. It had long shafts coming out radially from this central sphere. At the end of each of these shafts, maybe 10 to 15 in total, was a smaller sphere, each illuminated with a different color, noticeably dimmer than the central sphere. It zoomed right overhead, couldn't have been more than 20 feet over my house. I ran downstairs and told my parents. They told me to go back to bed. Next day I told my friends and teachers. They laughed at me. They suggested it was probably a stealth bomber because there's an AFB nearby and stealth bomber sightings aren't rare. This thing was the opposite of stealthy. So I have no idea what it was, but I'll never forget the night I saw the psychedelic sombrero. When I was about 14 years old, I worked at a summer camp at our town pool. One morning during camp, I was laying on the edge of the pool with my legs in the water, torso out on the pavement. Relaxing. I started to hear a really distant noise. Not quite annoying exactly, but loud enough and persistent enough to make me wonder where it was coming from. I popped up and looked around to see if I could locate the source of the sound. I was sitting near a fence that was located behind me with the parking lot on the other side of it. And I noticed two guys were in the parking lot by their car with the doors open. I thought maybe they had the radio on, and I could hear it from where I was sitting. No big deal. Until it started to get louder. Now I'm starting to freak out. It sounds like mumbled, unintelligible conversation. I keep looking around me, confused and now starting to get scared. I can't locate the source of the sound. And it keeps getting louder and louder. The voices in the conversation get clearer. I jump to my feet, still looking around me. Nothing. No one is near me. Where the f is this coming from? I start walking away from the pool and all of a sudden, the voices are clear as day. As if there were four to five people standing in a circle around me. Saying, enjoys oranges. Enjoys oranges. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. What? What? Enjoys oranges. What? At this point, I start crying and running at the same time. As I run, the voices get more mumbled and die down a bit. I ran halfway across the park to the playground and sat on the swings. I waited for the voices to die down completely. When they were gone, I regained my composure and went on with my day. That was the first and last time that ever happened to me. Freak the fuck out of me. And to this day, I'll never know why that happened. Maybe stress? Some sort of schizoaffective episode? Paranormal activity? I don't know. But that's the scariest, most unsettling thing that's ever happened to me. At my dad's last house, I walked outside on the back porch to get some fresh air. My dad and his, now ex, wife were preparing to set up a garden. He also wanted to plant a tree in the backyard, so after a little while, he started digging a hole for where the tree would be. When he was digging a hole, his shovel hit something, like a big rock of some sorts. So, dad started to work on getting that rock dug up. After a little while, he discovered that this rock was a fair size, I don't exactly remember how big it was, which made him really curious. An hour later, the rock was dug up. A day after the rock was dug up, I could never sleep at night because I would always get the feeling that someone else was inside the house, other than my dad and his then wife. There was one particular night that I can never forget. You see, my bedroom door was always left open, and that particular night, there was a candle lit up on a shelf, right outside my room. I swore that at one point in the night, I saw a shadow appear, then disappear near the candle. At first, I shook it off and dismissed it, thinking that it was my imagination that made up the shadow. A few weeks later, my dad told everyone that we were moving into a different house, which is in a different area. We moved out of that house, and moved into our new house, which is currently where we reside, and we've been here ever since. Then one random day, 
my dad asked me if he ever told me about what was really going on in the house. He never did tell me, so I told him that he's never mentioned it until now. He told me that the rock he dug up, was actually a tombstone. He said it had some foreign writing on it, that looked like Arabic. He told me that after he dug up the tombstone, he would see shelves slowly opening and closing by themselves, and that he would hear footsteps coming from the hallway. I asked him why I could never hear the footsteps. He said that they usually happened really early in the morning, around 1 to 3 a.m., when everyone else was already sleeping. Dad was afraid that things would get worse over time, so he knew it would be best if we moved. We later found out that the people who owned the house before we did, had a relative who passed away in the house, and was quite possibly buried in the backyard. When I was a sophomore in high school in Chicago, we'd hang out and smoke pot and drink in a forest preserve near where I grew up. Ever since I was a kid I would ride my bike the two miles to the edge of this specific preserve called Schiller Woods. You would always hear stories about Satanists sacrificing animals, suicides, and other macabre stuff going back to the days of American Indians. As a teenager, it was a great place to party a bit undisturbed. We'd typically make a fire and hang out at night and if cops or rangers were onto us we'd see them coming from a long ways away and take off. Over time I was completely comfortable there, and knew all the trails and whatnot. One spring night, my buddy Daryl and I were on our own and bored so we decided to go to the woods. We walked the two miles from my house through a suburb-like stretch of the city and got there around 10 p.m. There was enough moonlight to see decently enough to walk the trails to a cool spot called Hidden Hill. It ended up being demolished by some idiots with a 4x4 at some point, but at that time it was still there and a great place to chill out since you were elevated and could keep an easy out for cops or any other vehicles. I ended up making a small fire because it was early spring, and at this point quite chilly at night. The leaves had only just started coming back. I had to be careful and made the fire in this little dip at the top so you couldn't see it from a main road about 3-4 to four blocks away. My other friend, B, had given me a joint that had a bit of novelty to it as it had a wire that ran the length of the paper so you could use it to smoke the roach down easily. So I busted it out and we puffed it and bullshitted about school. It was pretty sleepy stuff and the fire was pretty warm in this little nested area. Without a word Daryl laid back and went quiet. I felt pretty tired too and soon enough nodded off myself. I don't know why I woke up, but I did so at a start. Daryl was still sleeping and the fire was all but dead. A bit warm with a small pocket of orange glowing coals. It had been slightly cloudy when we had gotten there, but now it was super clear and much colder. Other than the soft hiss of the coals, everything was silent. There wasn't even any wind. I left Daryl and walked to the lip of the hill looking towards the road to see if I saw any cops. Content there was no one around I relaxed and looked straight down the hill along the trail that disappeared into a grove of trees and saw a tall white bipedal creature pacing the foot of the hill. It had to be at least 7 foot tall and was milky white. It had long fingers and seemed to be nude yet sexless. The thing that stuck out the most to me though, was that you could tell by the way that it moved it wasn't a man. A human couldn't move like it did. Its gangly gait was just bizarre. I was just frozen staring at it. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I distinctly remember trying to look at it differently to make sure it was there. I looked to the road again in the distance and there were a few street lamps, but definitely no vehicles. That is when some motion caught my eye and saw there was another one, but halfway up the hill to my left brushing through the tall grass. They were definitely looking for something. Then I saw a third one far to my left down the hill at the tree line. Staring at me. That is what got me moving. I hunched down so I was out of their sight and hustled back to Daryl and woke him up. I was trying not to freak out, but I could hear my voice trembling as I said he had to get up. That there was something here. He was all what do you mean something is here? His eyes popped wide open as he said it. I grabbed his arm and was like come with me. I peered over the lip of the hill again and then I heard Daryl suck in some air. I asked do you see? He cut me off and said yes. Let's get out of here. No tell me what you see. He was beginning to panic and was said let's go way too loud making me cringe. The first one I saw down at the bottom of the trail looked right up at me at that point and I could see the light of the moon reflect into its eyes like you would on a dog or cat. He said with an annoyed edge to his voice that he sees a tall white thing and two more coming over here. He then looked at me and probably didn't like the look on my face because then he started moving away back towards the fire. He didn't know the woods as well as I so it was easy for me to make the decision to go down the back of the hill to a creek and cut left with him close behind. We followed the creek along a wide path to an open field that would lead us to a busier road and then into the residential area. As we ran along the creek we could hear something very large crashing through the trees next to us but slightly behind and gaining. We got to the open clearing and kept running, 
but halfway to the road I stopped and turned around. Nothing was following us, and other the dark stands of trees, despite the moonlight, couldn't see them. We hurriedly walked the rest of the field and finally felt safe when we got to the first block of houses. I never heard or saw anything of it again, and not too long after my social circle changed a lot and I was hanging out more in the city than near home. I wasn't too shaken up about not going there at night anymore though. When me and my sister were younger, I was around 10 and she was 7-ish, and my mom is driving us home from piano lessons, things are going normal as per usual. And then we drive by the big corn field near our house on a quiet street when my mom stops the car in the middle of the road and just looks at the cornfield. Me and my sister are both looking around like a mom what? She then proceeds to look terrified, run out of the car and just freak us out. It was so confusing, she comes back in totally fine like nothing had just happened and drives home. We both brushed it off as something not super important. Fast forward 10 years and me and my sister drive past the same place again and get that weird memory like we had forgotten it had ever happened. Anyways we asked my mom and she actually thinks we're crazy, but I can't shake the feeling there was a little glitch in the system and something weird happened. It just didn't seem like my mom. My cousin was murdered last year. His parents and sister told me a bunch of unsettling things that took place before he died. This guy was a real fucking bad ass and he paid the price for it with his life. But, two weeks before he died he started seeing shadows across his wall in the middle of the night. He called the priest about it and wanted the priest to come out and bless the house. The priest never got around to it. How could he have known? He didn't listen to his parents, but respected my mother, his aunt for some reasons. I never seen him distraught but he was so upset when my mother died. In the two weeks before he died, he kept dreaming of my mother trying to chase him to leave the community. He was killed on a Sunday morning and was supposed to leave the community on that Tuesday for training to fight forest fires. Two days before he died, he was logging with his father. He stopped working and asked if his father would make his rough box and cross if he was to die. His father just chuckled and no one would have guessed five days later he would be doing just that. Once I was asked out on a date by a guy I didn't know and didn't run in the same circles as me. I thought no and politely declined. Well he knew where I worked and kept coming by and would only order from me and he would leave a big tip. Now this was an older guy, not even someone I would be attracted to, I was in my 20s and I guessed him to be maybe mid 40s, and not good looking, and like I said, not my type, so again I politely said no. Well he kept coming in and he kept asking and well finally I said okay. Dinner. What could that hurt? I was young and broken hey, steak would be nice. Right? So he shows up with a dozen or two beautiful long stem red roses and a large gift box wrapped up with a big red bow. Wow, I reluctantly take them. Now it gets a little weird, I open the box and inside there's a tight red leather dress, hum, okay, I'm thinking, does he want me to wear this or something? I'm already dressed causal, didn't really want to go in the first place, and I am not putting on this crazy dress, it wasn't even in style, this was in the 90s and this dress, well, although it be expensive looking quality leather, it was an 80s style dress, you know the ones with the back cut out and oversized shoulder pads? Oh, 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 and studs, it had studs on the lapels. Yikes. Well, I kinda smile, one of those closed mouth don't know what to say smiles and I muster up the words, well let's go. I put the flowers in the box and the awful dress down and I walk to the door and we leave. The car ride is pretty silent. We go to some restaurant, some chain place, we eat, pretty uneventful. He tells me has an engineer and a divorcee. He talks a lot about his ex-wife and how she broke his heart. I'm at the other side of the table, looking at my watch trying not to be rude. We eat, we get the check. Almost over. He pays, we leave. Now, I'm on the other side of town, with no money for a cab and this guy is my only way home so when he says he has to stop by his house I'm like, ah. I'm getting a little nervous now, but somehow I need to get home. He pulls into the driveway of an unassuming suburban track style home, turns off the car and says, I'll just be a minute, you wanna come in? Well folks I should've said no, but guess what, I'm like, okay, remember, young and stupid don't judge, well, all that talk about his ex-wife hits me in the face like a bitch slap and here's where that comes into play and things get really weird, right when we walk in and the door he turns on the light and bam. I can't really believe my eyes, I kinda readjust my sight because I'm trying to comprehend what I'm seeing, they're lined up all the way across the back of the couch are dolls, lots of dolls with no clothes on and all mangled looking with the word B-I-T-C-H written across their little plastic heads. Yeah, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I ended up walking to the nearest payphone to call a friend for a ride. I got home safe, I never heard from him again. 
Moral of the story, don't be stupid, listen to that little voice inside of you when it says no. When I was in high school, I bought four bars of Xanax. I was thinking I would try one before bed and see how it felt. It started to kick in after a while and it felt really good, but I also got really tired so I went to bed and slept wonderfully. The next day, I thought, wow, that thing was strong, I'll take a tiny little bit before class. A whole one was too much. I look under my couch where I hid the rest, but only found an empty bag. Thinking I had blacked out and taken all four, I briefly felt unsettled and decided I probably should stay away from the stuff. I went to class like normal, kind of forgetting about the night before. I feel totally fine, but realize in second hour that I've been getting the date wrong on all my papers. At lunch, a friend came up and asked, Hey, are you going to Sierra's party tomorrow? I tell her that I'm definitely going, but I thought the party was on Friday. She looked at me strangely and asked me what day I thought it was. She said, today is Thursday. This is when I realized that I've missed a day of my life. I felt a deep sense of dread, wondering what I did, who I talked to. I asked around and apparently I went to school, acting more or less completely normal. I tried out for the varsity academic team and made it. I was active in class discussions, took quizzes, etc. But to this day, I remember none of it. I must have taken the pills throughout the day or something. It's as if I was missing and someone else took over my body or something, doing everything I would normally do. It still makes me feel kind of terrified to think about that. This is a long one but I will truly never forget it. Five years ago I was a little Mormon missionary serving in Nebraska. My companion and I were at church one Sunday and it was a typical Sunday. Said hi to all the families we saw in the halls and foyers. There was one 13-year-old girl in the ward named Mary. She was one who always had some sort of snack made up for us each week that she gave to us at church. Normally she was always so nice and polite and always took any opportunity to say hi to us. She was walking toward us in the hall that morning and I noticed that she was super pale and had this wide-eyed look and was just staring straight ahead without blinking. As we were walking by I said, Hey Mary, how are you today? I got no response. She didn't even look at us. Red flag went up because she would never do something like that. After church I told my companion that I wanted to talk to Mary's mom to see if everything was okay. When we found her mom I could tell that she was uneasy and just looked worried. I asked her and she immediately started crying. We told her that we would stop by their house immediately after church and see if we could talk with Mary and her family. When we got to her house, I just had kind of an eerie feeling. I asked my companion if he felt the same and he agreed. Mary's mom answered the door and sat us down in the living room. We asked her if everything was okay with Mary. She was at a loss for words for a moment and just told us that she didn't know. She said that the past week that Mary acted mad and disgusted toward her family. Mind you, this family is one of the closest families I've ever seen. She said that Mary randomly attacked her older brother earlier in the week. Nothing too serious, she just started punching and kicking him. Her mom couldn't understood the sudden change in her attitude. We asked if we could talk to Mary and see if we could get anything out of her. From the couch we were sitting on, we could see down the hallway where the bedrooms were. As soon as I saw Mary come out of her room and as she started walking down the hallway, I immediately had a feeling that I can't quite fully describe. It was the worst feeling I've ever felt. I could honestly say that one word that can kind of describe it, is evil. Mary had the same wide-eyed look that she had in church. She sat down in a chair in front of us and just stared at the wall in front of her. I asked her if everything was okay. She didn't answer and I asked her if she was mad at her family and why she had attacked her brother. She finally stopped staring at the wall and looked at me. That awful feeling I had, got worse when she looked at me and she said that she was told to hurt him. I asked her who told her and she said that the voices told her to hurt her family and leave. I asked her if she knew where the voices were coming from and she didn't answer. I asked her mom if we could give her a blessing and she immediately said yes. When we gave her a blessing, she didn't resist at all, she just sat there. After we gave her the blessing the mood immediately changed. Mary no longer had a wide-eyed, glazed look about her. Her color was starting to come back and she was breathing heavily. That awful, evil feeling that I had, had gone away. As male missionaries, we aren't allowed to hug females but after a few minutes had gone by, Mary gave me a very big hug and I wasn't about to fight it or deny it. When we left their house and got in our car, my companion and I just sat there for a few minutes. Thinking about what the hell had just happened. He finally broke the silence and said, I don't like the feeling I had in there. I told him that I had the same feeling. We checked up on her the next Sunday at church and she was back to being the happy-go-lucky Mary that everyone knew. We asked her mom how everything was at home and she said it was like nothing happened. 
A few weeks later I asked Mary if she remembered anything about it. She said that she could only vaguely remember attacking her brother and not knowing why and that after we gave her the blessing, it was like she woke up from a dream. Being a religious person, you hear stories about demons and possessions in the scriptures and in stories and there are the countless movies about them, but I never gave it a real second thought. I don't know exactly what happened with Mary. Whether she actually was possessed or if it was something else. She didn't crawl up the wall. Her head didn't spin around and she didn't talk in a different language. All I have to go on is the feeling I had when she walked in the room, her glazed look, pale skin, and her answer about the voices. I will never forget that story or the feeling I had. I hope to never feel that again. It scared the hell out of me. Sorry to get religious.